It's certainly my privilege to introduce our next speaker. She's a true pioneer in Malaysian archaeology, someone whose work has greatly expanded our understanding of our nation's prehistory. She began her journey in the 1970s, when archaeology was virtually unknown in this country. Despite her fear of leeches, snakes, and a love for luxurious bathrooms, she has braved the jungle for decades, making discoveries that have reshaped history, like the Lungong Valley, which earned UNESCO World Heritage status in 2012. Having built Malaysia's only center for archaeological research at UST Science Malaysia, she's confident that more breakthroughs are on the way, including the recent Kedah excavations. Today, she'll share what you didn't know about archaeology and some astonishing finds from Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to Professor Dato Zuraina Abdul Majid. Distinguished audience, I'm an archaeologist. Many people don't know me, but they know Indiana Jones. They know Harrison Ford. I don't know Harrison Ford, but I wish to thank him for making Malaysians excited over archaeology. And that made my work a little easier. Although he did it Hollywood style, for which I have to correct quite a bit. That was in the 1980s, when Harrison Ford created Awareness in breathtaking Hollywood style in search of gold treasures. But I found a treasure trove, not gold, but just stones and bones. Not glamorous, not exciting to most people, but it is these unimpressive stones and bones that have put Malaysia on the archaeological map of the world. Thank you. In fact, a machi who sat for days watching me brush earth from the stones and saw the joy in my face every time I found an interesting stone tool. She shook her head and she just wondered. One day she told me, Nanti batu ni esok jadi meh dah. Will this, will these stones become gold one day? And I replied, more expensive than gold. She had a puzzled look and she thought there's something wrong with me. She asked no more questions and she also never came to the site after that. <laughs> so you see, um, Indiana Jones gave the wrong story. Let me tell you what we really do. We are detectives of the past. Like detectives, we use whatever discipline that's available to us. Okay. Okay. We use any of the disciplines. Uh, we are multidisciplinary. We go anywhere to anybody who can help us solve our problems. We need reliable interpretations because otherwise our history will be scrutinized. So you see, it's not one way. They just don't help us, but we help them too. For instance, when we apply or we get help from medical sciences, we also provide them with ancient material on their discipline. Okay, this is, we study the past. And um, is there a pointer? Sorry, is there a pointer? There's a pointer. Okay. Okay, if in this line, this time varies from country to country. For us, our earliest is about a million years old, and this is prehistory. 99% of the time is prehistory. And to, history begins just here. It's a very thin. It's a very thin um, 
part of time. And this whole 99% of time is what is, uh, depends on archaeological material. And the deeper in time you go, the less knowledge you have. For history, very short time period, but you have a lot of knowledge, mostly from documentary sources. Uh, this is just the technology. It starts with stone, pottery, metal, and uh, today's technology. Now, when I started in the 1960s, late 1960s, don't calculate my age, huh? <laughs> okay? Um, our understanding of Malaysian prehistory was very, very little. It was piecemeal. And I just felt that it's so sad that we know very little about our past. But I was alone. There was so much to be done. Uh, so I told myself that I will have to have more, more archaeologists, more work, and I had to do it very quickly. Because in the 70s, we sent a lot of our students abroad for the sciences, and we regarded archaeology as part of history, which really it is not. It has both legs, one in the sciences and a little bit in the arts as well. So, um, time was against me. That was the wrong time. They did, you know, very few archaeologists around. Everybody was sent to be a doctor or a scientist, you know. And um, time was also against me because that was after Madeka, and the country was involved in a lot of development, digging of the land, um, and in the process would be destroying some bit of archaeology. Uh, and also, archaeology is a risky thing. You know, uh, you go in, and uh, if you open a trench and there's nothing, you have no artifacts, uh, and you go back with empty hands and no artifacts and empty pockets too, you would have wasted the money. So that was not the right time for me, but I had to do something about it. Now, what inspired me? Okay, that's like the potato. I had to explore what is possible, even if it is not probable. Okay, um, what, it, what inspired me? I did my PhD in Nya in the 1970s. And I thought to myself, how come there's a site here, and there's a site in, uh, in Java, uh, but nothing in Semenanjung, Malaysia. This is Sunda land. This is a land mass. So I said that, well, they must have come through Semenanjung, Malaysia. That was my hunch. But a lot of archaeologists at that time thought that they would have taken this route, they would have taken this route, and they would have taken this route, and perhaps Semenanjung, Malaysia. But generally, archaeologists um, who worked in, foreign archaeologists who worked in Southeast Asia avoided Malaysia. They said there's nothing in Malaysia. And that sort of hurts, you know, that we don't have anything. I said, no, we must have something. So I delved into the old records, and there was an excavation in 1936 in a place called Lengong that I hadn't heard of at that time. It was a small one-road town. And I said, okay, let me go to Lengong. I read, did all my readings and built my uh, clues. Uh, and um, I said, okay, let me try. But this was discovered in a place called Kota Tampan. When I looked at the map, there were so many Kota Tampans. Kota Tampan, Ai Bukit Kota Tampan, Kota Tampan, Estate Kota Tampan, uh, Kampung Kota Tampan. I said, where? This happened in 1936. I asked the locals, all of them, said there's only this one old man, you may, he may know, and um, uh, he was of no help. But when I did my... <laughs> but when I looked um, uh, at the map, I worked out, together with a geologist friend, a uh, colleague, I worked out possible areas, and I said, oh, okay, I know where to go. I had little dots on the map. But when I went down on the ground, it was a huge, that little dot on the map was a huge area, and I was looking for this little dot. So that was no good, no good. So, um, so in 
So well, this was the area, the uh, oil palm estate, that um, this colleague of mine, and a geologist, uh, the late geologist, uh, Professor Chia, we, were, we went along this road and we were very tired. We rested by the road cutting. And um, I just played around and lifted the creepers and I dug with my uh, tool, I dug, and I found a beautiful stone tool, just by chance. And I asked him, he's a geologist, he knows if it's, not, uh, if it's natural. So he said, this is not natural. And I said, wow, then this is quite uh, something. And just at the corner there, and that's the tool that I found. And I said, OK, I have to come back. And uh, later, I came back and opened this. had no money. Um, and uh, I took the fronds from the oil palm estate as my atap, my roof, and uh, some bamboo and poles, and started a very poor kind of a trial trench. Uh, and after about three days, I said, this is going to be something big, because um, I had found indicators of a site that had not been disturbed. We were the first hands to touch it and the first eyes to see it, since it was left there about 74,000 years ago. So I said, this is amazing, you know. Um, so I called my husband. He was my funder. He told <laughs> And I said, I think I found something. So he brought the children. They were totally unimpressed to see me <laughs> sit down under this roof. I said, Mommy, this is important. <laughs> you know? So, and as I was excavating, you see this hole? Six baby cobras came out of that hole. <laughs> and um, I had Indian boys helping me to carry the earth. And they told me, ini banyak bagus cikgu. You know, it's a good omen to them. That, you know, but at the same time, he said, um, the mummies and daddy will come to look for the babies. I said, oh, okay. I have a very, very deep fear of snakes, but that didn't stop me from leaving the site. I said, I'm not going to leave this site. This is too important. Oops, sorry. Now, what we found was amazing, undisturbed stone tool workshop. Now, a stone tool workshop is very important because it reflects the heart of the culture of stone tool technology. It's like us today and uh, the chip technology or whatever, because from the stone tool technology, they could make other tools from bone, from wood. So it's a very, very important part Paleolithic culture or the early Stone Age. Now, I also knew that this is going to be very important and it's critical that um, I record my evidence because don't forget, archaeology is a destructive process. We are taking it out from its original context, so we have to record it. And at that time, the new technology in computers was AutoCAD. So I measured everything and put it in AutoCAD because I know my colleagues worldwide not going, may not believe me. So I had to convince them uh, by uh, recording it very, very carefully. And what you see here is something that Southeast Asia had been waiting for and did not have. We did not know how man made stone tools in Southeast Asia. And this was the important evidence for it. I labelled everything. You can see um, uh, the tools making uh, the, uh, the pebble tool. Oh. Now, this is the anvil. The anvil is where they sit down. It's as if a man is sitting down there and he broke things and I could put the things together, the Ds and Ds and the Bs and Bs are things that I could put together, together again. Now, why is Southeast Asia so difficult to get in C2 sites? It's because of our climate. The climate would wash away um, any uh, uh, evidence, okay? Um, it was as if people had been sitting, many people had been sitting around, each one with this set of um, things. So I found this throughout the site. 
and I tried to get into the minds of these people. They were very clever. There were about five types of stone, to, uh, sto there were about five um, stone types, but they chose two, and they were the best two. It was as if they knew their geology 101. The other tools, no. Not, they, it wouldn't make um, good tools for them. So they knew what they were after. Uh, they knew the qualities uh, of the stones. And we also knew that they had a mental template. Before they made the tools, they know what shapes they wanted. And these shapes, earlier on, were said to be um, late stone tools. But I found them in Kotatampan, which meant that, no, 74,000 years ago, they already knew how to make these oval unifacial stone tools that were very typical of Southeast Asia. So they had a mental template. They know what they want to make when they made it. They know how to make it. They knew what stones to do. They were very, very clever. And you know what? I, I, found, uh, I looked at their garbage, what they threw away. And I said, let me study their garbage. Why did they throw these things away? And I found that they threw away two major types of stone. The one on the left, uh, this one, yeah, was too tough. They couldn't control the flakes they wanted because you see it's got very little lines of weakness. And this one had too many lines of weakness. The moment they hit it, it'll just break into shapes that's not controlled. So they were very clever 74,000 years ago in Langong. And, um, okay. This is somebody from the, the Deputy Director General from the museum who couldn't believe it. So when he came to the site, he said, I've been passing this area many times, and uh, he never thought it would be important. Now, what you see here is part remnants uh, of, the, uh, of the lake shore, an old lake shore. And they went to that lake shore that had a lot of pebbles. And out of all the different types, they knew what they wanted. They knew how to make it. They knew, they, and they knew what they wanted to use it for. OK, so now that little hut expanded to become something much bigger. And we found that this was a, a, a big area that they really used. Now, it comes to dating. Very difficult to date. Um, uh, uh, sites here, but this one, I was very fortunate because when I excavated, I found specks of white and I wondered what they were. So I sent them to the lab to be tested and they said it's a toba ash from Lake Toba that flew there. So we could get the date, Lake Toba, the fourth eruption, the last eruption was 74,000 years ago, that's how we got our date. Because I found, oops, sorry, how do I go back? Okay. Now this is about six meters of ash in Kotetampan too. We got six meters because it was a lake that, um, that trapped so much uh, ash. This is Toba ash. Okay, so with this, I could also know the cause of abandonment. Why did they leave the site? So I got the date, I got the cause of abandonment, I got the technology they used. I got to know their minds, that they were quite clever. And there was a theory that said Southeast Asia was the backwaters of civilization. And we managed to prove that Southeast Asia is, was not the backwaters of civilization. They knew their geology 01, they knew what they wanted. These people said it was the backwaters of civilization because this is what is considered sophisticated. Obsidian, very well flaked, very beautiful, so it was considered advanced. And this is ours, very rough. Now, this is like glass. Obsidian is like glass. It just won't do in Southeast Asia. It will break. It will not be a good tool for the tropics with its big trees, for the jobs that it would have to do. Okay, so this was part, Kotetampan was part of one of the, um, part of the migratory route that, was, that came in waves. Okay, this wave was 74,000 years ago. 
from Africa and down to Australia. It, it matched the dates in Australia. Australia was 60,000 years ago. Okay, then I said, these people can't be isolated just in Kota Tampan. They must have um, been found in the whole area. And the most natural place to find them would be in caves, because that's a natural home with doors, windows, ceiling, floor, you know. Um, so I said, let me look at the caves. So I went to this cave called Gua Gunong Runto, you know, like Runto, yeah? uh, Gunong to Runto. And um, I found it full of um, Runto, you know, stalactites fallen on the ground. Even entering the cave was hard. It was here. And going to work every day would take me one and a quarter hours uh, going up and another one and a quarter hours going down. So I said, well, oh, I have to rush. Okay, for, um, so I said, no, doesn't look good. I can't even find zero level, the floor. But I said, no, but I, something in me said, try it. So I said, okay, we'll go in. And see, you see how difficult it was to excavate. I had to get 20 men to lift those rocks off so that I could get a floor. And little did I know that just below this would be the Perak man. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and um, he was among boulders. He was among boulders. I'll just go through very fast. Uh, so we excavated the Perak man, and uh, it took us about two weeks to just clean him and clear him with lady sate and a paint brush. You know, it had to be done very, very carefully. And uh, he was buried in a ritual. Uh, he was buried with his stone tools. Um, and he, he, and um, uh, a lot of, about almost 3,000 pieces of siput sedot. Yeah? And the best and the biggest siput sedot, they, it was chopped, the tips were chopped and was found closest to his body, the smaller ones around him. Uh, and um, he was buried with um, meat from all these animals. And he was buried in a fetal position. When I first excavated him, I said, this man is short. How come? You know, that was just that size. Upunya, he was in a fetal position. And then we had to pack him. Uh, I, had, I, I, I waited a while and had to contact a colleague of mine in Java, a very famous professor who worked on the Java man, solo man, and very, very, uh, he's an anatomist and a medical uh, doctor as well, and a physical anthropologist as well. And I told him, look, I don't know how to bring him out. He's very brittle. I don't know how to bring him out safely down this um, hill, very slippery hill. And so he sent Dr. Agus Suprio here, his uh, assistant, his deputy, to help me pack the Perak man. He, I had never done that, but now I know. I've learned from him how to do it. Okay? Now, the, he, um, he used plaster of Paris and cotton to wrap the bones that were in in articulation, that, uh, that, was, uh, in, uh, that was in a piece, okay? And this is him, the late Professor Tekuyakop, a very famous man. When he heard that I found the Perak man and I described it to him, he came here straight away. You know, I, I, I felt that he was so important that I wanted just the best people in Malaysia and the best people outside to help me with him. And uh, then we unpacked him and found that he was about 154 cm tall. And these, he was born with a congenital deformity called brachymesophalangia type A2. 
Now, this type of... Um, uh, he is the earliest evidence for medical science of this type of um, deformity, congenital deformity, okay? I have no time, really, and this is just an image of him. And we gave him a Malaysian identity. <laughs> We had fun. <laughs> uh, now, that we give names to skeletons that are important for easy reference. This is um, the practice globally. Malaysia has more than 350 skeletons, but um, only two uh, that have played an important role for, um, for, for, for prehistory. Now this, I discovered him in Nia Caves when I worked there in 1970s. And um, that's his face. Okay, that's a skull. Those, that's his legs. And he was wrapped up with um, reed. Yeah. Now he's a special man. Uh, Nya, I gave him a name, Nya 77. That was when he was discovered. Um, he suffered a, a congenital deformity called Amelia. Now, he, you have ulna and radius, right, too, here, yeah? but he didn't. He just had one piece of bone. Oh, Olama. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, he had just one C-shaped bone, and his finger bones come out there. And he is the only evidence for medical science of this age. This is a skeleton about 2,000 years old, found in Guanya, Sarawak. That is, um, that's recently been made a World Heritage Site, just like Langong. And there are 1,223 World Heritage Sites, Langong, uh, um, archaeological sites, 28. So Langong is, and Nia are two out of 28 archaeological sites in the world. Yeah? Thank you. I, I have to, time is up, okay. Oh dear, you miss out a lot. Okay, now just this last slide, okay. This last slide, now we know our prehistory. Earlier when I started, I told you it was piecemeal, we don't know anything about it, blah, blah, blah. Now we have this structure, time, and all the different sites, and all this is done by USM, all the ones marked in blue. So now we have... We know our prehistory, we can be proud of our prehistory, and uh, not all are our dates. This one, two, uh, three, four, uh, give it one more, maybe five, are not our dates, okay? And um, I do hope that these sites will be well looked after, especially Langong, because our heritage is world heritage. So we have to protect it, not just for ourselves, but for the rest of the world. And I hope um, the efforts made by Think City and uh, NCER um, will be thorough and will, be, um, uh, will, will preserve the site for posterity. Thank you very much. <laughs>